I know it's a rainy day and it's uh, one thirty in the afternoon, and uh, we are all here, however, for a great purpose. We have a wonderful webinar being arranged by the Aquafil Mail Group and Presidency University. Special thanks to Dr. Mondol for taking the initiative and arranging this uh, great webinar in such a short notice. Of course, the background team in Dr. Mondol's lab, they have been working overnight for all setting up all the facilities. But since it's a webinar, I understand there might be lags and issues. So I, my humble request is to bear with it. And if you are having an issue, please, uh, you, you, can, you can communicate and uh, to the team what we will be trying to do is we will be trying to go through as well as we can so uh, i am sumit viswas and uh, i am uh, the pi of a lab known as vista lab in bispilani goa campus so uh, i hope all of you here will be able to enjoy and share the same uh, with that i am trying to present over here so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take you into the realms of oceans. So many of you are already familiar with this. If I'm trying to divide the ocean, I can divide it into different zones and realms. It can be dependent on the amount of light which reaches the uh, reaches that particular zone. It can be dependent on the amount of uh, amount of tidal activity in a certain zone. Or it can be very simply be divided into the amount of uh, in, in, into the uh, zone where you have immersion or inundation and a zone where you have some sort of a substratum or a land base. So for the time being, I will try to divide this zone into two, two zones, the benthic realm and the pelagic realm. Now, if you can follow my slides, you can see that the pelagic realm is a vast expanse of life and it is, the, of course, the most important aspect of life on Earth because if you remember, it is in the oceans that life had originated. Now, if I am going to talk about the oceanic zone, then I will never be able to finish throughout the day. So what I chose to do is I chose to talk about the benthic realm and a small portion of the benthic realm in particular which I am calling the intertidal zone. Now, if you again follow my, <coughs> sorry, follow my uh, slide, you can see that this small region at the top left corner of your screen, which is lying between a uh, alternating cycle of high water and low water, this region on the benthic realm or on the landmass, I am calling the intertidal zone. So, of course, very much understandable from the name why it is the intertidal zone because in this zone, throughout the day you have alternating cycles of inundation that is when the high tide rises and desiccation that is when you have low tide so people across the world have been able to divide the zone the intertidal zone into uh, separate into separate uh, categories as well <clears throat> some uh, divide it into three parts the lower intertidal zone the middle intertidal zone and the upper intertidal zone while some people also consider the supratidal fringe or the or the splash zone or the surf zone as one of the components of the intertidal zone as well now in the intertidal zone also there are different sorts of tidal fluctuations and this leads to different cycles of exposure and inundation so basically an organism or an animal which survives in this desiccation and rehydration throughout its life. So understandably, these animals have a sort of a specialized adaptation to cope with these things, to cope with the alternate desiccation and, in and, and rehydration cycles. Now, why I chose this intertidal zone is because I could also connect it to my own life. So uh, I can see most of the participants are from West Bengal. So some years back, I had made a journey from West Bengal to this western coast of the country in Goa. And uh, my talk will also revolve around these two coasts, the western coast of the country in Goa and the coastline that I'm more familiar with that's in West Bengal. So in this talk, I will first talk about something in Goa and then I will again take you back to the coastal regions of West Bengal 
where I will take my second a uh, second story ahead. So practically speaking, I will be talking today about two animals. One is the window pane oyster that you can see on the left of your screen, centered near about the Guan coast. And this is the the window pane oyster will be the will be, will be the hero of my first tale. And then again, I will shift back to West Bengal and the and the neighboring coastlines, and I will be talking about the horseshoe crab which will be my next, uh, my, my next protagonist. So in this journey back and forth, uh, I will take a break when I start the second journey and I will uh, let you in and ask me a few questions, keeping in mind the time constraint. So to begin the journey, let me begin with the two dramatis personae. Now you can see them on the screen. On the left side of your screen is the window pane oyster and on the right side of your screen, is the horseshoe crab. So I, as I, as I promised, I will begin first with the window pane oyster. Uh, its scientific name obviously is Placuna placenta lineus. And you can see I'm holding aloft a window pane oyster shell in my hand. Uh, this is a bivalve mollusk belonging to the Placunidae. And if you observe more closely, I hope you can see the mass of muscle that I'm trying to show with this arrow here. If you observe more closely, this is actually a very thinly crusted shell, uh, shell organism where you can also see the muscle mass since I'm holding this shell against the light. Now, why is this shell so important? Why is the window pane oyster so important? If I go back three or four centuries earlier, I will try to first find out how the name of the window pane oyster was derived. So as the name suggests, it has something to do with window panes, right? So in old Portuguese homes in Goa, you will find that the window panes were not made of glass, but they were made of uh, these window pane oyster shells, which were highly polished and were sewn together to form some, some of these window panes. So this is a picture of a typical window pane, and these are the window pane oysters, which had been strewn together. Now, now, not just the window panes, these oysters were also used for making chandeliers, they were used for making decorative items and a lot of stuff. Now, these window pane oysters were actually a very frequent sight in Goa. I will try to show you. Goa is a very small state. So for people in West Bengal, I will try to give you a perspective of how big Goa is. If I drive from Diamond Harbor and reach Barashat, then I would have spanned the entire length of the state of Goa. So Goa is a small state, and in this small state, you have a distribution of window pane oysters in a rather small region. Now, this small region, if you can see now, I have zoomed in in this small region. This, this is the bay area, or this, if you can follow my cursor, the bay area, which is stretching from the Dona Paula viewpoint on the north to the, to the, to the Sada headland on the south, the bay area intervening in between was the thriving place of the window hand oysters. So along the along the coastal regions in this bay area, that is, if you can mark here, there's a place known as Shridao, and the other place where you can see Chikalim and Zuari and all this stuff. So along this Zuari estuary, or it is also known as the Norshi Bay Area of the Zuari estuary, window pane oysters thrived in Goa in millions. Now, what I can say is that in the present age, However, the scenario is completely different. Even in the early decades of this century, that is uh, till 2010, there was an abundance of window pane oysters all across Goa. I mean, in the Zuari Bay area. Suddenly, after 2013, the numbers drastically declined. As in, there were almost none to be found. There was a short revival in 2015, but again, these oysters disappeared from the Zuari Bay area. Now, there were multiple reasons. I am not here today to talk of the reasons. I can assure you the reasons were anthropogenic. And what happened there was a lot of ship breaking and other activities were also taking place. Plus there was increased you know, activity of, of, of different sorts in these bay areas and the window pane oyster actually disappeared. So <clears throat> we joined this story, we joined the scenario somewhere in the 2015-16 uh, region. So here I have shared with you a plate where you can see 
uh, window pen oyster collection happening near about 2010. You can see local people sitting on the mud flats collecting window pen oysters. There are scores of them. They could even collect back pools in a matter of minutes. And uh, of course, they could make a, a good profit out of that. Now, why this oyster was important is not just because of its, because of its shell, but also because of the fact that some of these oysters can form pearls. And due to some unexplored reasons, the oysters found in Goa, the window pane oysters in Goa, had a 35% more chance of forming pearls as compared to the rest of the country. Now, the other thing was that the meat of these oysters was a huge delicacy and uh, you, could, you could actually see people uh, sitting along the banks of the river with, the, with, with these oyster meats and shell and these actually uh, sold for around 300 rupees a kg or so. So this was a huge delicacy and cultivating and har uh, not cultivating, harvesting these window pane oysters was a great uh, source of livelihood for the people in these local areas. Now, what happened meanwhile is when I joined uh, the when I joined the scenario in 2015-16, not a single oyster shell was being found in the places where these people had been collecting before. Now, these are some of the these are of course the intertidal zones which are exposed during low tide. So, if you search during low tide, if you search manually during low tide, earlier you could get lots of oysters without making an effort. Now, uh, in the 2000, post 2015-16 era, there were no sightings of oysters at this at, at these places. Okay, so we joined in as a matter of local interest, as Dr. Mondol had uh, had introduced me. I was also interested in doing other things, but myself, being a student of zoology, with basic training in uh, also some a lot of field work before I diversified to other fields, I thought this is a chance to again retrace my roots and reignite my passion for, uh, for, for, for zoological exploration and stuff. So looking into the window pane oysters, uh, I found that these are, uh, these, 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 these are quite big shells. These have quite big shells which vary from, uh, let's say, 18 to even 131 millimeter in size. And the uh, adults have a life cycle which can continue up to three years. And they produce also, and some of them, as I said, produce pearls. Now, a few of you might have come across this window pane oyster shell in a publicity stunt made by some sort of, a, can I say, a, a fraudulent claim for Corona cure. So these window pane oyster shells also had some medicinal value, as has been reported in in literature. So actually, if you had observed the press conference that was made by this Corona cure people they are actually holding aloft a window pane oyster shell. Though we were not going into it discussing what that for cure for corona was or whether it was a fluke or not. So window pane oyster uh, shells were also very effi efficient bioaccumulators. I hope all of you understand what is meant by the term bioaccumulator. And what they do is they have a great effect. They have a great uh, role in coastal environment monitoring. So to cut to the chase, uh, let us look at the life cycle of the lacuna placenta or the window pane oyster, as we know. Now it begins sometimes with a fertilized egg, and in approximately two weeks, the egg, the fertilized egg, makes a transition to a spray hinge villager and becomes a late villager larva before establishing itself on some sort of substratum as a pedi villager. You can see that on this on this on the screen okay fertilize egg to villager to late villager and petty villager now after this span of two weeks the petty villager tries to uh, tries to fix itself to either old oyster shells or to some rocky bottoms or even to shells of dead shells of other animals and within uh, within within uh, within uh, years of attaining maturity that is attaining fert uh, fertilization maturity it can actually produce eggs and sperms, which are again uh, bred together for going into the fertilized egg. So this in short is the life cycle of the lacuna placenta. Now, what we found was the lacuna placenta was not completely obliterated from the river. 
there were a few niche niche areas where they were still being found in small numbers and these small numbers could also lay eggs and these eggs could grow up to pedivelija larva but the pedivelija larva could not find its attachment to some sort of a substratum why here the anthropogenic anthropogenic activities were playing a harming or disturbing effect what happened is due to constant movement along the river bed that is along the uh, along the mud flats of the coastal uh, zones the pedivelija larva did not find a place to attach as a result of that very few of them could grow to become adult males and females and therefore there was a dearth of uh, dearth of sperm and egg and finally the next generation did not eventually happen so this was our first observation that whatever larval form was not being able to grow was due to its uh, due to its inability to find a substrate uh <clears throat> excuse me so this is uh, another schematic of the of of the of, of the way the placuna placenta undergoes its life cycle and you can see that uh, the pedivelija needs to have some sort of a setting on which it will form early spat later spat and finally grow its shell sites to become adult oysters which can have uh, but which which can have a reproductive ability now what can we do at this situation so here in came handy help from the wildlife trust of india and we started a oyster conservation project so when i started this oyster conservation project i did not have a lot of manpower so the first thing that i had to do is i had to introduce the 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 the, the state of affairs to the local stakeholders and make sure that they have an equal interest and equal idea about what is going on so this is the this is this is the features map of the bay area i divided my search zones into into into, into the different forms so i have uh, this plot as the chikalim area and the south jasim area and we formed different teams and groups and kept searching in these zones <clears throat> so in the chikalim side of the river that is to the to, to the west side of the river we found that there was almost no oyster shells left whereas in the double limb side of the river that is towards the east of the river we could see that there was some sort of a there was some presence of 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 this of this window pane oysters so what we did was we undertook a two prong strategy for helping with the oysters now i will show you a short video where you can see how difficult or how uh, laborious it is to actually search for oysters in the window pane area this is one of my associates from the local villages his name is alex pechego he is actually looking for oysters like this in uh, some waist deep water they would manually go and scan these areas scour them and try to fill the river bed and scour them for window pane oysters so they used to divide in, uh, into groups and search for days before they would have some sort of a luck okay so i hope you have seen the video and uh, i hope the, the connectivity is still holding so looking like this we thought that as many people as we can involve we will have a better i better better uh, shot at conserving them so what we did was we tried training all the local stakeholders now we have uh, different uh, one villages are a little well developed like we have fisher folk as well we have uh, rich land owners and we have different sorts of rich trolley owners and stuff so what we did was we involved all of them and tried to imbibe in them a sense of possessivity as in we uh, inform them of the rich heritage of window pane oysters in their villages and we train them as to how they can understand which places they can be uh, finding window pane oysters how to handle these window pane oysters and how not to disturb their breeding grounds so we undertook a series of different training workshops again with the uh, with with the with the generosity of the wildlife trust of india and we more or less converted this into a movement so we started this last year and i can surely tell you that this year we have 
the entire village i mean it's not a very small village it's a huge area it's uh, the entire village along all the villages along the coast along along the estuary area actually they are all participating in this conservation project and all of them rep repeatedly try and help us in this project as well we also involved the church and the local authorities so we involved the panchayat we involved the parish priest here you can see the pictures of the panchayat members whom we trained manually to, uh, to 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 look for oysters as well as to help in their conservation the parish priest the church father was a great ally he actually uh, was a trained botanist and he helped us also in educating the villagers so what we had was a very thriving ecosystem where the people involved were aware of what was happening and they made a great effort and they are making a great effort to help us conserve the window pane oysters this is a picture which is taken last month before we could before we were restricted from going out so here you can see i have also been able to trace you can see this is how the oysters are found in the mud when i take them out from the mud if you clean them this is how they look and uh, we have a dedicated team as i told you and our dedicated team now regularly looks for these oyster sightings they don't pick it up they try and protect these areas where the sightings have been found now this picture what i am showing you right now if you can sh see me clearly this is a oyster shell we have been trying to help in breeding now before i come to the next part of the talk i will uh, really like to thank not just the local people but i am also a uh, lot thankful to the lab members my uh, my students at bits pilani and my phd scholars everyone who has helped me in this conservation work now just conservation by guarding the breeding sites or by helping them uh, in growing the river won't really help because the situation is very green so what we did was we had a clever idea and behind this clever idea i had a lot of help from my mentor dr anil chatterji who is a retired marine biologist i will introduce him more in the later stages of my talk so with again funding from the wildlife trust of india we thought of creating some sort of a artificial incubation system or an artificially stimulated ocean stimulator system which will help us breed these window pen oysters in a way that they can find a substrate until which they grow to reach their adult size so we designed this incubator and you can see the incubator on the right side of your screen so this is the incubator which we constructed and i will just give you a short idea of how this incubator works so if you can see this transparent glass or uh, acrylic sheet it is our acrylic cage it is here that we uh bring small uh, uh, shouldn't say small villagers here that we bring a uh, more or less mature villager and uh, allow them to rest here now these are the ones which would be releasing the gametes in a few weeks time the conditions in the river are mimicked to perfection of course we studied them beforehand we uh, studied wave action so you can you can see these yellow knob like things these are the ones which stimulate the wave action and we also maintain the exact salinity grain size and other things that are essential for the growth of the oysters so we uh, have three different compartments or three different chambers in this incubator the top chamber is where you have a reservoir of water having the same salinity as the water in the river the middle frame or the middle cage is the place where we actually place the oysters and the bottom cage that you can see at the uh, see at see, see at the bottom uh, at, at the end of the picture is the cage where you have the flow off this is a self sustaining system this runs just on electricity there is a pump as you can see at the bottom i will show you a different view of it there is a pump over here which actually is instrumental in making this water cycle or water flow continuous and with the help of this pump this system can be maintained at almost zero maintenance there is just the cost of electricity of for running the pump for months at an end so using this incubator what we could do is we could successfully breed and grow the window pane oysters in a in an artificial system now 
what we have now done is we have also created cheaper versions of these pumps and we have actually uh, distributed a few to the local stakeholders for example uh, we have made uh, this, this 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 one we made as for a demo version so this is a little more expensive we have made ones made of local materials like bamboo and uh, waste materials like uh, like 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 uh, big paint tubs which are thrown away and we have distributed these to local villagers as well who have made this sort of a backyard or a household hatchery incubator system and that's how the program has been thriving now if i can divert a little bit because it is also uh, being a molecular biologist and, uh, and and a proteomics person it's also my duty to look into other aspects of the window pane oyster as well so which other aspect should i look into i thought of looking at how the window pane oyster you remember this is a this is an inhabitant of a intertidal zone where you have different sorts of different sorts of uh, uh, desiccation and rehydration cycles going on now if the window pane oyster has to survive the desiccation rehydration cycles it must have some sort of mechanism within itself which will enable it to it it to it, it to do this so we did a sort of we have we are still in the process actually we did a sort of uh, desiccation study this is a physiological study at which we tried to understand whether exposure to a certain normothermic desiccation stress leads to some <coughs> changes in the window pane oysters proteome and the gene expression of it as well so what we did was first we uh, undertook some physiological studies as we tried to understand the amount of uh, amount of pelial water and the amount of extraneous water that the shell was carrying when we lifted it from the environment then we uh, blotted it transferred it again to a damp substrate we actually had different sorts of uh, different sorts of uh, control experiments we tried to see whether uh, we could replicate dehydration and, uh, and and rehydration cycles inside our labs and with these we tried to understand how the window pane oyster was uh, able to un able to withstand or overcome the desiccation stress so after the physiological work what we did was we also tried to look at how the proteome or how the protein composition of the window pane oyster reacts or responds to the change in the, uh, in, in the in the desiccation rehydration cycle. So what we do is we uh, accumulate protein from different biological replicate tissues of the window pane oysters. We label this for mass spectrometry using eye track. We, uh, we, 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 we let it go through a cryptic digestion procedure. And after that, what we do is we will uh, we, we uh, analyze this using a mass spectrophotometer and then try to see the changes in the proteome with a software known as proteome scan. Now, with these things, what we are trying to do is we are trying to look into the overexpression or the suppression of expression of different proteins which would be involved in the in, in the in the withstanding or the evolution of the desiccation stress. Not only that, we have also looked in, we have, we have also plans, we have not done this as of yet, we have also plans to look into the gene expression profiles of these oysters in, during this desiccation stress. So what we would ideally do, we will we'll be going to extract the RNAs, try to see which of these genes are overexpressed, and we will compare the uh, transcriptome of the, of, of the, of the desiccated versus non-desiccated, that is the hydrated uh, physiological conditions, and try and compare them again also with related organisms like other oysters and mollusks, which have been studied till date. So this is our plan of action as of now, and we have actually adopted a two-pronged strategy. One is the conservation effort, and second is the understanding of the life cycle of these oysters. So we plan to achieve a scenario which was present in the pre-2010 uh, in days when you had abundance of window pane oysters in the river. So actually the good news is this year we have a better situation. You can see that we have received some uh, received some uh, some some publicity through press. This is a Times of India article 
in which they have covered or walked we call this process by which we grow window pane oysters in artificial incubators as sea ranching and you can see that we have achieved some publicity they have uh, they have they have uh, accepted and acknowledged the other thing that really gladdens us was the peripheral success as well now what you can see in the second part of the picture is another group of oysters which are known as which which is known as tisrio in goa the window pane oysters are known as mendio in goa and uh, these are the, these these oysters are known as tisrio so the tisrio which was not present in the river for the last 6 years have also appeared alongside thanks to the great support and participation of all the local stakeholders who have helped in this process apart from that this beautiful clusters of things are known as green mussels or shinane in uh, in local terms the shinane had also disappeared from the river and you can see during the lockdown these are my volunteers who from the villages who are walking in the river banks they are sending me these pictures and calling me to give me reports that see we have now got both shinane and tisrio back in the river along with the mendio now does that make our job simpler actually not the publicity that has been generated regarding the reappearance of these clams i told you these are edible and these are a considered great delicacies in goa the publicity that has been generated from this has resulted in a separate sort of anthropogenic activity we have had to handle a mass uh, sort of uh, extraction and uh, in this in, even in times of the lockdown people from far off areas are trying to come to the river and collect these off remember these are people who don't stay in the villages along the river they are coming from other areas and trying to extract them so the next challenge that we are faced with is how to stop these sorts of unwanted anthropogenic activities which will counter all the good work that has been done along the river i am again go back to my presentation screen and i will try to bring you to the next part of the talk which is about the horseshoe crabs so as i promised you i will uh, go from the east west part of the course so i am more or less <coughs> done for today with the west part of the course and i will try to come to the eastern part of your course and try to come home where i will be talking about the horseshoe crab now this is something which many of you have seen uh, in, in 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 your in your local vicinity and in places where you should not have seen them as well because these are these are i think uh, sold along the streets of dharmatala as a local quack cure for a number of remedies the reason for this is uh, i will just try to uh, bring the horseshoe crab into perspective from a geological time scale now the horseshoe crabs are very primitive organisms they descended from uh, what we known as the trilobites so the mud dwelling primitive trilobites were which lived in precambrian eras uh i can time that at around say 600 million years ago were the direct ancestors of the horseshoe crab now the horseshoe crab uh has been in the same sort of morphological form or it has evolved into this present form around 350 million years ago you can imagine that this has been an organism which has been surviving for the past 350 million years ago in with very little changes in its morphology and i can actually vouch for the fact that they have been unchanged since the past 350 million years ago now what you can see on the screen is the fossil of a primitive horseshoe crab known as mesolimulus walchi which was found in the upper jurassic layers of 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 what you know as bavaria in germany and this is one of the earliest reports of a uh, fossil uh, or earliest dated fossils of horseshoe crab that has been found till now there have been further sightings or further reporting of horseshoe crab primitive horseshoe crab fossils so this is a very famous uh, site in kansas in usa where you had multiple sorts of paleolimulus what the plates that you are seeing over here have been named paleolimulus you have multiple forms of the paleolimulus fossils been available all over this uh, sites in kansas now what we have seen is that uh currently there are four major species of horseshoe crabs which are found in the world now the four major species are 
limulus polyphemus tachyphleus tridentatus tachyphleus gyrus and carcinoscorpius rotundicorda i am sorry for the typo it's car carcinoscorpius rotundicorda so these are the four existing species of horseshoe crabs which is which are prevalent in today's world now these four exist of these four existing species uh, the distribution is like this uh, you can if you, if you are looking for limulus polyphemus you will be able to trace them or you will be able to find them in the atlantic coast of north america from mine to the yucatan region if you are looking for tachypleus tridentatus you will be able to find them in western and southern japan in taiwan in philippines in north borneo and malaysia if you are looking for carcinoscorpius rotundicorda you will be locating them in the bay of bengal region in thailand malaysia borneo philippines and other places the one which is closest home is the one which is found on the in the shores of india is the tachypleus gyrus uh, which is found in the bay of bengal's northeast coast so that is where i am going to go back home you can also find these in thailand malaysia borneo and philippines now as i said the most abundant species which is found in the western found in the shores of the eastern coast or along the bay of bengal is the tachypleus gyrus mula and so this is my journey back home and now i will be taking you for the last uh, for the coming uh, 20 25 minutes through the life cycle and through the great lineage of the horseshoe crab plus i will also introduce you to some of the path breaking discoveries that has been made from different components of the horseshoe crab so if you can i hope all of you identify this coastline so this coastline stretching from chadipur till mondarmoni and a little bit ahead near the near near near, near the namkhan islands <coughs> is where you can find horseshoe crabs in india of the species tachypleus gyrus pula so in this entire arc what have been shown over here is the place where you were able to locate horseshoe crabs in abundance now most of the work that we have done is however concentrated at a place known as boloram gari this place is an orissa near the chadipur beach and in boloram gari you have a very rich nesting site of horseshoe crabs now the horseshoe crabs uh, are actually uh, not exactly intertidal zone animals they are abundant in sandy to muddy areas but when they breed they have to migrate to the intertidal zones and such as the creeks and estuaries now on the beach that is uh, that is mostly i am talking of the boloram gari beach the tachypleus gyrus actually prefers to nest where you have a mean grain size i hope you all understand what grain size is grain size is the average size of the grain of sand we have mean grain size ranging from 63 to 125 micrometers so these are the places where you have the best chances of finding horseshoe crabs a very interesting observation is that if the sand of that particular grain size moves due to some reason it has also been seen that the horseshoe crabs shift to tend uh, shift to uh, like uh, like uh, uh, move their nest away to the place where the grain of sand of that particular uh, 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 size has shifted as well so there are multiple interesting things about the horseshoe crabs that need to be said but we will not be able to do that entirely in the entire span of this uh, presentation so i will first try to talk to you about uh, a few uh, common things that we know so uh, people who are from orissa or from the uh, coasts of sides of digha or mondarmoni will actually recognize this uh, of this this organism as ram lekhoni as in it's the pen of ram because of the end uh, because of the tail spine of the of the crab which is a long elongated thing looks like the tip of a pen uh in the, in in boloram gari though the people actually uh, call that call these things as bom kachi and uh, that's the local name of this thing so basically what this looks like it looks it looks like the hooves of a horse that's how the name comes the horseshoe crab the hooves of a horse the size of the carapace of the tachypleus gyrus because we are talking of those alone here and i will be talking about tachypleus gyrus uh, sizes and, and and properties from now on 
The size of the horseshoe crab is around, uh, the carapace is around 250 millimeter, but it's also true that the females have a much bigger carapace size. There is some dorsolateral flat, uh, dorsoventral flattening, but the females have a much bigger carapace size compared to the males. If you look at the carapace, you can identify it by its yellowish gray color. And if you are uh, being able to identify the tail sun, you will also see that the tail sun of the horseshoe crab is triangular in shape. Now, as I say, uh, for breeding purposes, uh, the horseshoe crabs try to migrate to the intertidal zones or estuaries. And it is here that we actually meet them. So, uh, there, here again, I will have to uh, come back to Dr. Anil Chatterjee. He is the person who has been instrumental in doing everything about most of the things about the horseshoe crab in India till now. He has been worked, He has been on it for three decades, and thankfully, I have been uh, I have been humbled by being included in his group, and I am carrying forward his lineage of work now. So, what the horseshoe crab does? This is the male and the female. You can see that the female is much bigger in size than the male. This is the copulation of a horseshoe crab, male and a female, and when they uh, when they breed. They lay eggs. You can see the egg over here. This is how uh, an egg looks when it has just been fertilized. And the egg grows over the weeks and attains what we are going to call some, as perivitalin fluid. Now, this perivitalin fluid is very important. The perivitalin fluid has hundreds of usages which are great benefit to, the, benefit to mankind. Now, as the egg grows, you can see a small thin membrane-like outer covering is developing. And in this membrane-like outer covering, the perivitalin fluid accumulates as well as the embryo which grows starts taking shape. Here again, I will try to show you a small video uh, taken in our lab where I will ask you to focus on how you can see embryos moving inside the, inside the perivitalin fluid. Just take a look. So if you can see over here, this is what we have grown in a grown in a small protected environment. Keep a look at the embryo and which is rotating in the middle. I will play that once again. Take a look at the embryo which is rotating in the middle. Here, one at the periphery as well. You can see that in, within the within the shelled egg and within the perivitalin fluid, these embryos are continuously moving. I will come back to the presentation. Now. What Dr. Chatterjee has actually done is he has found a way, he has developed a technique to actually artificially induce this sorts of fertilization in horseshoe crab eggs. So using an, electro, uh, 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 an electrode based technique, he has uh, this method of inducing the horseshoe crab uh, egg release and therefore the fertilization and then using inland hatchery systems he can act also actually have a mechanism of growing them in a artificial environment. Now, why is this required? I am telling you that you can find horseshoe crabs and horseshoe crab eggs and all that. So, why is this required? Now, uh, can I ask somebody to unmute his or her microphone and tell me the one biggest use that the horseshoe crab has been put to till now? Anybody? Can anybody tell me what is the biggest uh, human derivative from the horseshoe crab that we have got till now. I think, sir, the blood uh, is... Yes. Could you please identify yourself? I can't see the screen. Uh, my name is Sumit Mullik. Uh, yeah, okay. Thank you. That's the correct answer, actually. So, uh, the blood or the amoebocyte lysate what we know of now, this is also something which has an Indian connection. So Dr. R. Nandan, uh, who was, uh, though he was based in USA, he was an Indian scientist there. He patented something which is known as the LAL test. Now all of you might have heard of the LAL test. So LAL stands for, it's an acronym for uh, Limulo, Limulus Amoebocyte Lysate. Now what the LAL test can do is, it has been it has been taken as the singular most efficient and the one stop test for detection of endotoxins in any sort of material either that can be dairy product that can be medicines 
that can be any that can be any other enzymatic product that is sold to you so what happens is the clotting enzyme the lysate in the amebocytes it forms a opaque gel in no time when exposed to minute amounts of endotoxin or any sort of bacterial pyrogen now this has been taken as the standard test for detection of endotoxins in any sort of uh, medium and the rate of formation of the opaque gel by the lysate is directly related to the concentration of uh, the endotoxins present in the uh, present 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 in the particular uh, 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 medium which you are testing now what has happened is the resultant thing is due to the great usage of the of of of, of the horseshoe crab amebocyte lysate millions of horseshoe crabs year wise are actually uh, harvested and their blood drawn to extract uh, for the lal taste the result has been what is the result of human greed the result has been that the numbers are now steadily declining and if the if that if the if the if the tasting industry keeps on drop, uh, drawing endotoxin from horseshoe crabs a time will surely be there when we will have very little of this left and we have already started that time on so it was required that some sort of uh, some sort of idea of, of preservation should go into this and that's why there was this sorts of artificial uh, in, uh, artificial incubation and uh, extraction of uh, fertilized eggs as has been done by dr chatterjee now i will try to talk a little bit about the pvf i'm just giving you small glimpses because i won't be able to touch upon all the subjects of these things which are of interest so this is how the pvf looks if you see this is a egg a fertilized egg of the horseshoe crab in which the crab in which the embryo has been growing so this yellow part is the embryo and the resulting fluid around this is the pvf now you have to understand a few things one is this is an organism which has survived 350 million years it has survived how many pandemics you don't know it has undergone very little change so whatever is key to its under key to its survival and key to its development and key to its such tardiness lies within its developmental process so what we have found out is that the pvf or the perivitelin fluid which surrounds the embryo in the horseshoe crab egg is instrumental in doing a lot of things Today I will be giving you just a few uh, brief experiments. I think I'm running out of time. I'm already almost late actually. So here is one work which has been done by, at the lab of uh, Dr. Surendra Gaskarbi uh, in ARI Pune, where you can see that the effect of PVF actually leads to the formation of myogenesis in chick embryo. So that actually leads us to understand that the PVF or the perivitelin fluid has a lot of proliferative activity as well. It's a rich source of proliferative activity. I will show you a second instance. If you see, these are endothelial cells, which are, if you see the plate A, plate A is endothelial cells at a own site, and plate B is endothelial cells, which have been formed after addition of PVF at the own site. You can see that the endothelial several contributions by Indian researchers. I actually like to say several contributions by Dr. Chatterjee as well. So uh, these are some of the things that has been done over the years. They have produced amoebocytes. We have uh, regenerated gill lamellae. They have improved vertebrate cardiogenesis, as I saw, showed you in the previous slides. There was wound healing. Uh, there has been proliferation and, uh, and, and of dental pulp stem cells as well. There has been uh, some sort of effects on tri uh, on uh, different triggering human uh, bone marrow differentiation into cardiomyocyte that has been documented as well so what we have to do is we have to take this forward how do i take this forward so the next part is what i will try to show we have done in our lab now this is a this is this is a small question to everybody does anybody know this guy does anybody know this person he is a nobel laureate Okay, so uh, I would request you to go and see. This person has got a Nobel Prize working on the optic nerves of the horseshoe crabs. Okay, and this was a Nobel Prize in physiology. So <coughs> if you can look for the name Hart Kopner, you will be able to see that he was the recipient of Nobel Prize for 
figuring out the uh, signaling stimulus in optic lives and he used photographs for that. But that's a different part of the story. So what is the thing that we do over here? Now, I believe all people or most of the participants here are biologists and uh, what you have definitely come across in your, uh, in, in, your, in, your, in your biology lectures or lessons is that you have heard of what is known as the Speeman Mangold organizer. So if you remember the Speeman Mangold experiment which, and you would remember that there was a uh, formation of a second embryo and this is what he called the neural induction upon implantation of the dorsal lip of the blastospore. So this is what Speeman Mangold had done years back using a frog you can embryo. do that in Ampioxus, you can do that in frogs. Can you also do the same in a farther primitive system which is stretching into the invertebrate lineage? What does our current knowledge tell us? So these are the experiments with the Ampioxus. What does our current knowledge tell us? Organizer and neural induction are mostly specific of chordates. It does not happen in echinoderms, it does not happen in hemichordates, but it happens in cephalochordates, urochordates, and of course in other vertebrate. But if you look at mollusks, annelids, or arthropods, the members of which are horseshoe crabs, you will find that there has been no neural induction as of now. Very interestingly, we have found that you can actually induce secondary embryos by grafts of certain center cells under the blastopore in horseshoe crabs. So what do we plan to do? We plan to induce a secondary embryo formation in horseshoe crabs using the dorsal end of the blastopore. And we are going to find out whether the same genes which are involved in embryogenesis in Ampioxus and are also involved in the same sort of embryogenesis in horseshoe crab. This work we are doing uh, in collaboration with Dr. S. Hector Escriva, who is an expert in blastopore induction. And uh, the, the work has been uh, going on for some time, but has been stopped, stopped temporarily because we need to shuttle between France and uh, India to do that thing. Now, a few more interesting things I will show you before I take a pause. Do the horseshoe crabs embryo understand polarity? Do they understand the polarity of magnetic dipoles? This is an experiment which will show you likewise. So when I suspended a few horseshoe crab embryos in a, under a magnetic field, you can see north here, it has been pointed and south away from it. When I placed them in the field, they were their movement was <coughs> equilateral. After a span of around five minutes or so, or so, we found that there was some sort of movement, there's a tendency to move towards the North Poles. Further, when I left this alone for another five minutes, I could see that most of them were trying to zone towards the North Pole. This gave us an indication that the horseshoe crab embryos also have a way of sensing the polarity or sensing the magnetic poles. So uh, there were other studies which we performed in the lab as well. So this is a preliminary study which we did with uh, which we did with uh, growth of Staphylococcus aureus. You can see that the zone of inhibition which has been formed <coughs> due to the growth uh, due, uh, due to the application of PBF is more or less similar to what a traditional antibiotic like gentamicin does. So we also have evidence of the antibacterial effects of the PBA. Now this is the most interesting thing that we are trying to do. We have separated some fractions of the PVF. I have not told you, uh, PVF is a very rich source of proteins. So if you can extract the proteins, purify them, you can also have some sort of growth of dermal papilla cells. That is, I'm trying to tell you that horseshoe crabs, PVF, is good enough for regeneration of hair follicles as well. So this is what we are driving at right now. We are trying to find out uh, whether if you if you can apply PVF, that can be used as a cure cure for alopecia in the near future. Uh, so what is the time? It's almost 26. So I will take a pause over here. These are my different lab members. These are the people who have worked in the lab and uh, present, working presently with me. Uh, the funders who have been very generous in helping me with the uh, with, with, with the with the with the uh, work going on in our labs, 
these are the different funding agencies and of course i have to thank rich pilani for giving me the opportunity to uh, diversify and explore different options uh it's a very small world uh, so these are some of the collaborators with whom i work and here in the picture is dr anil chatterji who is holding around a huge horseshoe crab which he i think had extracted in malaysia so with this i would like to thank all of you for your patience i have tried to touch as many topics as i can within an hour of the lecture and some i have not been able to go into depth i would really appreciate if you have understood this if you want to contact me further for questions or queries my email is sumit s u m i t at the rate of goa g o a dot b i t s bits hyphen p i l a n i pilani dot a c dot in so i will write that in my chat box as well so if you have further queries which i may not be able to address at the end of the session please feel feel to please feel free to write to me and finally uh, i have been stuck in goa for the last 5 months not being able to uh, go to kolkata which is my hometown though but do come visit us see the conservation work we are doing over here we will love if you participate contribute give us uh, give us fruitful suggestions or give us share anecdotes about con about such similar works that you are doing at your place and we would love to have a more enriching discussion in the scientific community where we we will see the how aquatic ecosystems can be helped to thrive and prosper so thank you so much thanks for your patience it has been a long talk but thank you for being a very patient audience and if uh, it's good enough i will try to take questions from now on so can i stop the presentation dr mondal yeah yeah thank you sumit for your nice presentation uh, we apologize for uh, technical glitches which has already occurred i don't know what is the problem because we we practiced uh, almost from last one week but somehow today this network is very very poor so i readily apologize for this inconvenience caused and from subsequent session we will give the link for, for joining in uh, g meet so uh, so now uh, as i can see a lot of question has been poured in this chat box but uh, due to time constraint as we have the next lecture of the sam dupon so we may not take all the questions so few questions will be addressed and as already sumit told that uh, these questions will be uh, delivered to him through email and uh, once he responses we will keep it is in posted in our website marine ecology website so don't feel bad that uh, your question is not entertained or not asked we all respect your question and due to this uh, problem we are facing now we have to restrict few questions and over to fomi the research scholar of marine ecology laboratory he will take up some question from the chat box and ask shumit uh, to answer over to you fomi thank you sir thank you dr shumit biswas for giving such an interesting and excellent coverage on intertidal zone and its community states to inhabitants we had such an information and informative session which told us about the window pen oyster as well as the horse shoe crab now <coughs> we it is so fascinating how dr vishwas delivered this topic in such a lucid and exciting way i hope you all uh, find it very interesting and informative but as we all know we have time constraints and we have to move on to our question and answer session we have received too much questions to uh, attend you know so we have picked some of them and we will answer them one by one so i will pick the answers one by one and ask dr vishwas to answer them as if seems fit can i ask dr vishwas yes, please, sure. thank you thank you for yes the so the <coughs> so as uh, asked by sakura konar is there any effect of global warming and changing sea levels on the intertidal zones ah uh, i would uh, I, i i would definitely like to answer that question the global warming and the intertidal zones are closely related as in if you see the tidal uh, height that are being attained over the years you will definitely see that there has been a change so the zones that i had shown in the first part of the presentation those zones are also having a change so if you had uh, uh, there are different marks you called low low height mean tide 
high high mean tide so these different mark these these boundaries are also getting obliterated so we can understand the organisms which had been living in those places they are having uh, they are having to cope with those effects as well now this is why uh, global warming would have a effect on the intertidal organisms as well i hope that answers the question okay thank you sir so the next question was from dishinya gogoi okay so he uh, she asked if oysters gets extinct what it will tell us about the marine environment uh, we would not allow the oysters to get extinct that is our goal and we have we have been we have been uh, trying to do everything to prevent that from happening so what i can answer to your question is if you if you if that if that sort of scenario really happens we can really understand that things are turning very bad and uh, for a, for a species to get extinct where it was thriving 10 years back it means that there has been a drastic change in different uh, conditions in the in, in in its environment like i will uh, i will try to enumerate the changes you can have changes in the salinity you can have changes in grain size you can have changes in the ph you can have changes in water temperature and what not but thankfully this parameter these parameters that we monitor day to day have not shown a great uh, a, a, can i say a great uh, uh, decrease rather i feel that anthropogenic activities going on along these coastal shores i'm talking for the window pane oysters here have been the ones which have disturbed their habitat loss uh, a lot so as i told during the talk itself if i keep on changing the substratum where will the larva get a place to fix themselves on so in order to get uh, get get a get a hold on these sorts of activities we have to educate the people because anthropogenic activities of course uh, is starting from human kind and that is why we took this first step of educating people and since they stopped to a certain extent there has been a revival of oysters and clams along the river so uh, that is how we look at it so i hope it answers uh, the question so the next question is from som subra datta so he asked what's the food habit of horseshoe crabs has it remained conserved or changed over time as we know that it is a very primitive animal the food habit of horseshoe crabs is more or less conserved it it it, it thrives on uh, planktonic forms of uh, uh, forms of food and uh, i do not know of the food habits of primitive horseshoe crabs uh, because uh, from the from the fossils you really can't get an idea of their food habit and they are mostly casts or moles so we have to not get an idea of the food habits but what has uh, what i can say is it's mostly remained conserved as it's still uh, a sort of planktonic food okay i hope that this answers your question there are so many questions that i can't take all of them you know there is a very much time constraint for those who have not who have not gotten answers for their questions can contact our guest dr viswas through uh, email as he said question? earlier uh, uh, mr Tarzi, yeah. can i answer one question this has been asked yeah, yeah, by yeah, dr chakraborty who has asked yes. me Been efficient enough to sustain an adult oyster for three years, or is it only for growing oysters in the younger stages? So actually, this incubator is not for the three years of its lifetime. When the oyster is capable enough, or when it is grown enough to sustain uh, these changes in, in its environment, we actually release them back into the river. So we don't grow, we don't plan to keep the oyster in the incubator for a whole span of its life cycle. Then it will never be able to adapt any more to the river and conditions again. Uh, I will answer a few questions. Where in India these oysters are found? You find them in Vizag, but these are of much lower quality than the ones you find in Goa. The window pane oysters are mostly uh, in the world. They are found mostly in Philippines, but in Philippines as well there has been a existential crisis. Okay, so uh, those are the two questions I wanted to answer. Okay, sir. I hope these answers all of our questions then. So, who have not gotten answers for their queries can ask our guest to his email as he said earlier. And I have please keep my in... email ID. I have shared my email ID at in, at the bottom of the screen. So please feel free to uh, to 
your questions to me over more. Yes, of course. So uh, please keep in mind that our guest is also very busy and will try his best to attend uh, your emails. So please be patient. Okay. Furthermore, all these valuable sessions will be available on YouTube too. We, uh, we know that uh, it has faced so many issues and so many uh, bufferings. So we are apologize for that. And you will find them as the recorded sessions in the YouTube later. So you can follow them up and please stay tuned. So I, on behalf of Mary Nikolaji Laboratory, express our sincere thanks to our honorable delegate, Dr. Sumit Biswas, who has taken out valuable time from his busy schedule and enlightened us with his knowledge. Finally, I will extend my thanks to our main ecology laboratory members who worked really, really hard to make this program successful. And also to the audiences who have made this program successful with their presence and also cooperation. And thank you for, uh, for bearing with us. And thank you and stay tuned for the session at 4 p.m. by Dr. Sam Dupont. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you, Sumit, for your nice presentation. Thank so you. Thank you, Sumit. Thank you, Sumit. You as well. Yeah, yeah. So today it's a very uh, terrible day is going for us. I, I don't know. Uh, this uh, internet issue is uh, really troubling us. I don't know. And uh, we, as we are uh, locked down, and we cannot access the university. From there, uh, may, might be the internet speed is good. But however, as we are uh, operating it from our home network, it is more uh, giving problem to us. Anyway, these, these are uh, uh, the power problems. So we sincerely apologize for this. No, no, no. You have done your best. Please. Don't yeah, yeah. We are we are trying to, uh, to uh, solve the problem. And uh, but anyway, don't feel uh, bad that all the things are getting recorded, and it, it will be posted soon after our speaker's uh, talk or at the end of the day, maybe probably. Anyway, uh, so uh, stay tuned for our next uh, speaker. Uh, Dr. Sam Dupont and uh, another link will be sent to the telegram group who have joined in the telegram group. However, please keep in mind that we have the restricted number uh, capacity in this Gmail uh, talk uh, forum uh, and that's why we cannot uh, take all the participants requests here. So please join at least 15 minutes before to this link. Okay, so we are sending the link. Uh, soon in the telegram group okay thank you very much and have a nice time and stay tuned for the dr dupont's talk okay bye bye thank you me. very much goodbye